It's my privilege to introduce to you Sean Blacknot. Uh, Sean was invited to one of our churches in Gaborone, um, Botswana, to share the word of the Lord there. And Sean said to me, hey, I heard you're doing the POA and I'm going to pass through, fly in early from Botswana just to come and sit in and enjoy, enjoy the POA. And I said to Sean, if you're coming, then at least do one session with us. We need to hear your voice. And you know, in, in proverbial statements, they say it's never over until, nah, you, know, you know what I mean? Um, so it's never over until the prophet speaks. So, so put your hands together for Sean, who's been with us for forever, part of the Gate Global family, and somebody that we respect greatly in our family of churches. Good to have you, Sean. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be here again after <clears throat> such a long absence. I think the Lord has kept me hidden now for six years. <laughs> Said to me, I must go nowhere. I must. He just wants to form some new stuff inside of me. And so it's the first time that I'm traveling again. Uh, today I want to do something that is very peculiar, very different. I think that apostles, they build into the mind, and prophets build into the heart. So I want to talk today about singing the song of the bow. Um, but before we get there, I want to just make a few statements. Because of time, I'm going to just be very quick in what I'm going to do. A true kingdom impact is not primarily external, but internal. Say that again, a true kingdom impact is not primarily external, but internal. So the direction of true change is always inward to a stronger position of God within the heart. The position of God within the heart, mighty manifestations of power, the power of God without internal structuring of the heart is useless. Luke 21, 17, Jesus speaks. Now, when he, Jesus, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation or empirical study or external study. Nor will they say, here is it or there is it. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom, the inherent structural rule within the hearts of men is on the inside, not the outside. The heart is very important to the forward momentum of what Apostle Thamo has been talking about. The two tablets of stone upon which the law is inscribed that Moses carried from Mount Sinai were two tablets of stone that was external to the people. But the new covenant reality in Jeremiah 20, 31 says, I will write my laws upon your hearts and upon your minds. So there's the writing of the law through sent ones upon the hearts and the minds of God's people so that the covenantal values are no longer external to a people, but is now internalized in the mind and in the heart. So now the covenant is no longer just something that we read from the outside, but it's become a people that has become the carriers of both dimensions in the mind and in the heart that is reconstructed. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. Above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life, or it is the wellspring of life. In the Hebrew, lev, L-E-V, it refers, the heart refers to the immaterial makeup of a person. That what we call the soul or the personality. The heart is, the, is then the center of a man's will, his thoughts, his emotions, and his conscience. The Old Testament attributes a wide range of human emotions to the heart, including love, loyalty, fear, anxiety, 
All of these things are attributed to the heart. Today we would say that the heart represents the real you, but totally hidden self, as Apostle Peter calls it in 1 Peter 3 verse 4, the hidden man of the heart. So the heart is then defined as the foundation of our actions, the holding place of divine principle, the seat of our emotions and motives, the wellspring of all our actions, the center and seat of all the principles that undergird how we behave. Proverbs 27, 19, I'm just making some introductory statements. States, as water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. You can already see where I'm going with this teaching because now fundamentally what God is after, he wants to rip off the masks and he wants us to become clear, concise entities that must showcase him in his value to a fallen human race. We must clarify the inner constitution of our hearts before God. Just as God is building into the mind, God is also building into the heart. So, we talk then about the heart as that reflector, like water reflects a face. Like James talk about the mirror of the word. So water is a reflector and the word is a reflector of the face of Christ through your life as you get into the water of God's word. It begins to reflect the face of Christ through your life to other people. So our hearts bring definition to all of our life. Our lives and the condition of the heart is a reflection of the state of the soul the mind, the emotions, the will, and the conscience. 1 Samuel 16, 17 says, sorry, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Man is fixated on what is external, fleeting, circumstantial, evidential, but God is focused on what lies beyond external reality. The architecture of God is always pressing beyond what is fleeting, external, circumstantial, outward that we can mask. But God now wants to rip open the masking of his sons that we become clear and concise in his sight and in the sight of all men. Because God has set eternity within our hearts. The perception of God is not shaped by external reality. For God is spirit and spirit operates out from eternity, the timeless, invisible realm. Now, I want to make a statement that is very important. You've got to write it down. Deception lies in the realm of appearance. Deception lies in the realm of appearance. Appearance is a false facade of reality, masking reality, sitting in a church service, not being who you're supposed to be, singing songs unto God, but it's not real because it doesn't come out of a heart that reflects the face of Christ. These things are going to be brutally dealt with. My task is very difficult. Because I've got to tell you exactly what the Lord told me he's about to do in his church. God is no longer playing games because there is this fast track to the reality of, of that which God wants now in the earth. And he wants a people to conform instantly to the things that he is desiring from his church. Repentance must be instantaneous. We cannot take 50 counseling sessions to forgive a person. We've got to come to a realization as I hear God speak, as the speakings of God come, I internally reason with the Spirit and I make right that just there where I'm seated. I can't go home and go make right. I've got to make it right just there as God speaks. I repent and I say, God, forgive me. I'm moving on. I'm going to go see the people that hurt me and brutalized me. This is where things are maneuvering toward. 
So the perception of God is not shaped by external reality. For God is spirit and spirit operates out from the timeless zone, the invisible realm. So deception lies in this realm of appearance. Jesus once said in Matthew 28, sorry, Matthew 23, 18, you to the Pharisees, you outwardly appear righteous to men. He uses the word appear. But inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. To be lawless means that I'm not practicing the principles relevant to a kairos that God's throne is dictating in a particular season. I go, I come to conferences like this, I come to schools like this, I take the notes, I go home, but I'm not practicing the principles relevant to that which God instructed me. I know I'm hated by my many people because I'm, I'm a straight talker. My head is as flint. You can take your best stone and stone me. <laughs> but I must say what God told me to say wherever I go. These Pharisees, they, Jesus harshly criticized them for their outward displays of piety. Their actions were inconsistent with who they really were in their hearts. And now God is examining the heart just as much as he's building into the mind. God is after both these two things that should define every son of God. And in Luke 16, 15, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Pharisees were men who lived double lives. Outwardly, they sought public approval. They, were, they made a point of following all the religious rules and worked hard to impress people so that they would appear godly and wise. But God knew their hearts, for God evaluates man only by the condition of your heart. Man look at the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. If God was to ascribe any value to you, it's based on the heart and the condition of the heart at any moment in time in your life and my life. We can't fool nobody any longer because God is about to rip the masks off from our faces. Because God is now in that straight, that final movement of his church to ultimate governance in the earth. If we want to rule and reign with Christ, then as we have heard earlier on, we got to walk as Jesus walked in all things. Now, I'm not shouting at you I'm speaking into the spirit and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm speaking to some other people that are not here today. <laughs> so Pharisees are those who hold to a truth structure which they never apply to their personal lives. They had theology with no incarnation of its principles. They spoke the truth of scripture which they could not manifest, neither demonstrate. They love theology and knowledge which puffs up, but the truth they know never find practical applicability in and through their lives. We need to focus on cleaning the inside of the cup, as Jesus puts it, or the inside of our lives, or the houses, our spiritual houses, cleaning our inaccuracies in our actions, our inaccuracies in our habits and our misaligned motives. Father longs for the heart of his only begotten son to be the heart of the corporate son, the church, the body of Christ. Only one heart vibrating in the house of God, in the sons of God, the heart of the son in the many sons, one heart beating for the Lord in the earth. We are taught in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, to love God with all the heart and to love our fellow man as we love ourselves. That which 
that, 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 that should then become the foundation out of which everything we do and say commence or operate. In other words, how do I live effectively out from the foundation of the first commandment? Shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And the first is likened unto the second. You must love your neighbor as yourself. Love becomes the ultimate foundation out of which life must proceed. Loving God, loving humanity, first before loving yourself. And so this is where I believe God is pushing thing toward, things toward. In his incarnate state, Jesus perfectly matched, mirrored, represented, and embodied the heart of the Father. In fact, Jesus demonstrated how to live out from the heart of another. And living that heartbeat for another, out of another, for and on behalf of others. So he wants us to live for the benefit of others. Jesus was father focused in all of his life, in all of his endeavors upon the earth. And he never contradicted nor violated the eternal will and desire of the father's heart, which is the heart of love. The ultimate horizon to which God is pushing the theses, the principles of doctrine, is to come back to the ultimate that explains and generates an understanding of who God is in his nature. God is love. And that's where the apostolic church will have to maneuver toward. We will have to become not just the holding place of that principle of love, but the demonstration of it out of every act that we perform in the earth. Love. Say love. Love. The heart of the Father is the very source, the protection, and the covering out from which the Son lives and operates. Remember, John 1.18 says, The Son who is is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared or make known Him. The bosom of the Father is a metaphoric uh, designation for the deepest, most profound, intimate, affectionate, and tender person, uh, a position within the heart of the Father that the Son operated out from. And so we see that relationship with the Father flowed out of this tender, loving care and commitment to the very intimacy and the interconnected relational building ethos within the Son that he wanted to relate exactly everything the Father was in being, action, and character. And he had to expose it through his heart toward humanity. Father is spirit, but exudes eternal unfaltering love. He is love. The inherent nature of our Father is that He's love. The Son came in demonstration of that love through the heart that was perfect before the Father. And the church must be the depository, the dispenser and the distributor of that love to a dying humanity. We must conform to the total image of Jesus Christ, the Son, and that includes not only his actions and commandments, but also his heart. Scripture reveals for us quickly the heart of Jesus as a heart of humility, a heart of gentleness and care. Come unto me, all that are weary and heavy laden. Come and Come and take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly of heart. I am meek and lowly of heart. I am meek and lowly of heart. Come and learn from me meekness and lowliness of heart. And God wants us to learn from the Son, the Son, that meek and lowly estate. He he had a heart of compassion, a heart for the lost, an unselfish giving, a heart of sacrifice, a heart of mercy, 
a heart in which his judgment was preceded by mercy. The heart of a lamb, the nature of innocence and defenselessness, and the sacrificial nature and the naivety of a lamb. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. There was no comeliness, no, no, no beauty in him that we should desire him. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but it pleased the Father to crush him. And it was in the crushing of the Son that the substances of the eternality of the Father came forth through the Son. And there couldn't be a demonstration of the heartbeat of the Father through the heart of the Son. With that said, as an introduction, I want to give you now for the remaining of the, of the time, I want to turn your attention to a practical biblical example. I want to use an historical template called David. You see the prophetic imports uh, biblical templates out of the Logos, and so sculpture prophetic architecture out of which we draw substances for our learning today. So I want us to go quickly, because of time, I want us to go in our Bibles to, let us just see, let me get to it, to 2 Samuel chapter 1, and I want to relate from verse 17 to 27, 10 verses to us and then just unfold it, and I will go, I will go sit down. <laughs> Can we have that on the board? What should our heart's position be as we move into what we call Zion, or Davidic positions in the spirit? Zion speaks of the ultimate place of government, or rule, or the administration of God's rule. So I want to relate to you now some issues of divine government. Divine government has got to do with bringing divine regulation and sanction upon satanic systems. And rule which has got to do with setting divine standards by which humankind is supposed to live. And coming to a position of reigning, reigning has got to do with the administration of the authority of the Father through a many-membered Son in the earth. So I want to import these principles from the life of David as he is about to negotiate his final transition before he ascends the throne of God. Now once, the Bible talks about, in Amos chapter 9, that the fallen tent of David must be raised up again. Right? When we talk about the tent of David, we talk about the bunch of principles that describes David in his Davidic heartbeat in terms of wisdom, understanding, all the things that flowed through David's life, creativity, warfare, all the stuff is what I believe I want to unfold to you right now. So there's one particular event I want to draw your attention to here today, which I believe is going to become a very vital event ingredient before God would allow any people to rule and govern effectively for him in the earth. We talk about governorship, we talk about rule, we talk about the administration of God's authority which is reigning, but there is a pathway to reigning and the final transition that David had to make was this final thing that David had to settle in his heart before he could come to Zion. Now we know that Mount Hebron in natural physical Israel is the highest mountain peak. When you stand on Hebron physically, you can look on Zion because Zion was of a lower elevation than Hebron. And we know what Hebron means in the spirit. Hebron means the place of covenant, the joining of the heart, the place of conjugal relationships, the place out of which partnership come for life. And God will not allow you to go to the place of ultimates of rule and governing until we have settled the issues in our hearts concerning our interconnected building covenantly with one another. 
until the issues of the Father and the Son is something that we don't just talk about anymore, but it's living inside of us as a relevant issue in all of our lives. In other words, there must be no squealing. There must be no longer doubting whether these things are of God. We just need to incorporate them, incarnate them inside of our lives. In other words, the principles can no longer just be external to us. It must be internalized. Say internalized. So the principles must be internalized. In other words, there must now be a, a people that can demonstrate this apostolic. It can no longer just be people that hold an opinion about theology and the doctrine of Christ externally, but a people that can reveal it, demonstrate it, and showcase it in their lives. Until we get to that place, we will never ever govern for God anything. I hear what Apostle Athamo is saying in it. Whatever he's saying is the truth. But the spirit of the Amorite, we will not be able to take that mountain down until we come to this clarity of art with one another, with our spiritual father, and with the family in which God has incorporated us into. If we can get rid of all the falsities, if we can rip the masks up, off and become real, really real with one another. Then you can say what you are on the inside and you don't feel offended, and you don't feel brutalized because another has heard who you really are. Where I can share openly with my Father in the Spirit, my heart, and I can say, this is how I feel. I've got this issue that I just can't overcome. Please help me. But the reason why we've got defeat, and the reason why so many things are going wrong is because, you see, the issue is the mask is in place. Pharisees are role players on the stage. They now know how to play their role effectively when they are in crowds like this. We can mask the inner self perfectly, but God knows who you are in the heart. You can't, we can't get past the scrutinizing eyes of our King, of our God. It took the Lord six years, Pastor Thamo, in which God brutalized me. He said, I'm going to reveal yourself to yourself in the six years. And I want you to repent of everything that you, that you never even thought was existing in your heart. I want to go into every crevice of your heart and I want to scratch out everything that you thought you are and I want you to bring it to a place of repentance before me. You see, I was a man full of myself. I was a man that, 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 that would that would, would, would look at ranking in the spirit because of what I think I knew. And God says, I will rub that out from underneath you and make you a dependent man like Jacob. I will touch you in, this, in, the, in the seat of your strength and I will make you a leaning man, a man dependent for everything upon me. There must be nothing in your life that bypasses me when you come to me in the reality of every aspect of your life. I don't want you to become a man leaning on systems. I don't want you to lean even on the doctrine. I want you to lean on me as your God, your king, and your master. Yes, I will use the doctrine to shine the light upon your soul, to showcase who you are to yourself. It was painful as the Lord took out the knife and he began to cut. So this last few years, difficult years for me, tough years and I had to reconsider my life. I had to have long, quiet moments of introspection. I had to sit down and because the Lord says, where I want to take you, son, you've not walked before. I've kept you here because I want to deal with you so that I can take you into nations that you've never gone in before. Because God said to me, unless we can love, unless we can love the unloved, Unless we can love the Muslim and the Hindu, unless we can love the people that, that is on the periphery of life, then how dare we represent him? 
So God will take an apostolic company into these places. Maybe we'll have to demonstrate the love of the Father to a people that are without a father. And we become that fathering dimension to a people without a father. In, in other words, we become a father church, a church that understands the patterns of reality as they exist within the heart of the father. And we begin to reveal these patterns to a people that has been lost all their lives. And we embrace them and we showcase to them the reality of who God really is. The only way that they will know God is by us. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. By your love for one another. No other way. And so it's imperative that I want you to listen very carefully here today. I said to the Lord, I don't want to stand on pulpits anymore that you have not sent me to because I'm not, I'm not a guest speaker. I don't want to guest speak in every, anybody's conference because unless Father sends me, wherever I go, I'm illegitimate in what I will bring. That's the narrow path that God is pressing upon a true apostolic company. That we no longer just speak as we want to. But our speech is tempered by him sending us. And, is he, and, if he, and if he doesn't send you, you just remain home, clean your yard, and love your wife. Until he calls you to go. But you don't go out of your own. You go only as you hear that voice sending you to go. So let's see, I must go quick here. The one thing that David had to deal with before he could come to the, govern, to the place of governorship in Mount Zion, he had to deal with King Saul's hatred toward him. How will he respond to the news of Saul's death? Come, let's read a few verses of scripture from 2 Samuel 1, 17 to 27, very quickly. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son, David. Sorry, his son, Jonathan. And he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow, as it is written in the book of Joshua. Extra biblical book. Next verse. A gazelle is slain on your, house, on your heights. He's speaking about Saul. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, lest those that misinterpret it so scandalizes him further in his death. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. O oh, mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain, may no showers fall on your terraced fields. For there the shield of the mighty was despised. He, the shield of Saul, no longer rubbed with oil. The mountains of Gilboa was cursed that day by David. If you go today into natural Israel, no dew nor rain ever fall on the mountains of Gilboa because as the rain come, a wind would sweep it away. Still giving vent to the word that this prophet spoke years ago because of his love for a fallen slain general in the armies of God. Let's just go further. Next verse. On the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life, they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughter of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. 
I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. And now the transgender community says that David was a homosexual because of that statement. But they don't understand what is written there. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. Okay, next verse, next verse, last verse. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war perished. Let me quickly unfold that for you before I sit down. The news of, of the death of Saul and Jonathan caused David to break out in the song which he taught the whole of Judah. This is the sound that must captivate the hearts of all apostolic people and it must define our posture in a belligerent world. We must break out and exude the song, not externally, but the disposition of the heart. It's inward, the temperament out of which we exist. So we know represented fleshly carnal leadership of self-indulgence, self-promotion, self-aggrandizement, and selfish motivation. His reign brought about fracture, fragmentation, and relational disconnection, and the pursuit of national identity was along the lines of tribal imperatives. Saul is from Benjamin, and, 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 and David is from Judah. And we know that God allowed his permissive will in Saul becoming a king. Because no king comes from the, from the tribe of Benjamin. They can only come from the tribe of Judah. But God allowed this man because they were asking for a king just like the nations around them. And God allowed his permissive will to take effect and gave them a king. And gave them Saul. But Saul never once in the tenure of his 40 years inquired of the ark of the Lord. Similar conditions exist in the global church today. There's profiling based on doctrinal prowess. The nation of God is fragmented into thousands of disconnected denominational entities and institutionalized religious compartments. In the midst of crisis, fragmentation, fracture, and the obsolescence of a decaying religious order, God begins to undertake an inventory of the character and the soul of the nations in our day to identify prevailing deficiencies in the earth. I want you to know David's response to the death of Saul, the old order. He tears his clothes and he mourns. He executes the Malachite that came to tell him about the death of Saul. And he sings the song of the bow and instructs that that song be taught to the entire house of Judah, the house of kings. Only a house of kings can sing the song. Oh, the mighty has fallen. These reactions reveal David's heart's position. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. Because in the death of somebody that persecuted him, resisted him, wanted to wipe him out, he still sang the song of the bow to a fallen hero because how the mighty has fallen, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Even though he criticized me, even though he reviled me, even though he went against me in my own life and hunted me down like an animal, but I will still in his death sing the song of the bow, how the mighty has fallen. Until an apostolic church comes to this place where we can sing the song and exude it out of our hearts for those generals in a previous order of church that went against us, tried to kill us and taint our reputation, and we can still say, these were mighty men of God. I will lay myself in the dust for them and their children's children to walk over into the new experience in God then we are not worthy of the title apostolic in this season. Because God is now dealing with the inner issues of the heart concerning even the ones that has reviled us and persecuted us. That's why Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies, love them that hate you, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. I told some brothers that are so out for this natural Israel, issue of wiping out the, 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 the people of Gaza. I said to this brother, I said, the greatest son that ever lived in the flesh of the Jews is Jesus. And you got to follow what Jesus said. Love your enemies. Why don't you love these people that you are bombing into smithereens? 
And until you can love them, don't call yourself the holy people of God because you are not, because only the church of Jesus Christ can carry that title. People don't like that. God will deal with Israel, they say. Allow them to kill these people indiscriminately. I say, no, 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 no. That's not the heart of my father. My father's heart is a heart of love that can embrace everybody, irrespective of whether they're Muslim, Hindu, or somebody that does not subscribe to what you believe in. Can you love the unloved? The ones that revile your, your relationship with Christ, can you still love them? That's what Jesus did when he was on the cross. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. That's the heart of true sons of God. David never sought to achieve the kingdom by fleshly means and competition and rivalry. He exhibits great respect and reverence and honor and love for those God had chosen despite their failures. Saul was a man that failed God. Kingdom was dared from him. But David never saw Saul after his failures. He saw Saul in his estate before he fell and sang the song out of his heart to this fallen hero of the faith. If we cannot get to that place, we will never go to the mountain of rule and reign for our king. Because we have heard earlier on that the constitution of his heart must clothe over our hearts. As he is, so are we in this world. This is the place where we go to. Remember Revelation 14. Standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. In other words, this apostolic company must know how to stand in relationship and partnership with a lamb, having the nature of a lamb upon them, of innocence, naivety, self-sacrifice for the sake of others, living in the earth for the benefit of other people exclusively. That's what Jesus did. He lived exclusively for the benefit of us. That's why he gave his life. And there must be a church in the earth before this great and dreadful day of the Lord comes that demonstrates that dimension back in the earth as a corporate son given to humanity in these last days. Until that happens, we're just playing church. And I don't want anything to do with that. I said to the Lord, if that's church, I don't want it. Father, take me back to where I come from. But Lord, I want reality because God, God did what I'm telling you today with me. He ripped the mask off, off me. And he revealed me to myself. And he said, that's who you really are. And I had to be instant in my repentance before the Lord. And so these are the imperatives in the hour in which we live. Okay? So this Judah is representative of an apostolic tribe, an apostolic culture, and an apostolic dimension. A sent people who are entrusted with inspiring the entire body of Christ toward the fulfillment of eternal purpose. The order in God is love, and love prefers the other about oneself. We are being built as the dwelling place of God, a place constituted out of love and for love for others. That's what God is after. We should not be a people who seek to be admired or seek the approval of the majority. We must know how to carry the rigors of God's task and manifest the prophetic burdens of the Lord, irrespective of opposition and resistance and being marginalized by the church establishment. This song represents the proper apostolic response to a previous order that has sought your demise, who resisted you, scandalized you, and misrepresented you. This song of the bow is a disposition Inherent qualities of the mind and character of how things are arranged on the inside of you that produces your behavior and actions that lines up with him that sits upon the throne. This song is also an internal stance within the heart, an attitude of flowing in the opposite spirit of your accusers. 
This song is about learning how to celebrate and honor and respect those God had chosen despite their failures and treatment of you. This song of the bow is therefore a song of war. Not against another human, but against the principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, we need to come to identify the, the architecture of the throne beyond external reality. We got to press our sight beyond externalities. Because Paul puts it this way. He says, henceforth we no longer know one another after the flesh, but after the spirit, not even Christ. We no longer know Christ after his Jewishness. We know him in his eternal state. And so we need to have the passion to have the perception of God from the eternal to see a human as he really exists in, my, in God's mind. So we can no longer be racists. And we can no longer operate by the culture of the day. And we can no longer operate by the, by the, by the variance that our ethnicity brings. For in Christ there is no more male, no female, no bond, no free, no color bar in Christ. No Indian, no black, no white. No Indian, no color, no black, no white in Christ. We are all one in Christ. There can be no distinctions. Okay. I'm rushing through past the song. <laughs> Every time God wages a war, he employs a lamb. Every time God fights, he uses a lamb. When Father God waged his ultimate war against sin, sickness, death, and evil, he employed his own lamb, Jesus, his son, who gave his life in love for those who rejected, condemned, ridiculed, and resisted him. As sons of God, our Father, we wage war in love and with love. Jesus sang his song of the bow on the cross in which he made an open spectacle of Satan, triumphing over him in death and resurrection, forming out of the spoils of war a new nation who would represent his name and cause in the earth who we are. It was on the cross in the pangs of death that Christ taught us how to celebrate those who all their lives have been enemies, standing against us, those denying us, those who profaned our names, those who scandalized our efforts to advance the purposes of God. The order in God is love, and love prefers the others above self. We are being built as the dwelling place of God, a place constituted for love and out of love. I'm nearly done. We are God's ecclesia. We are his governmental family upon the earth. Government is the ability to bring divine regulation and divine impact upon human and satanic systems in the earth and so to cause the eternal intents and purposes of God to proceed according to the eternal plan. This should flow out of a heart of love for all humanity. It was Jesus Christ who taught us how to forgive, how to love and accept our worst enemies when he said, but I say to you, love your enemies. As he's flowing in the opposite spirit of those who all your life has mistreated you, cursed you, and hated you simply because you have chosen Christ as the way of life. Learn to defer all your actions to Jesus Christ. Let him fight your battles. He is the avenger. This was the song which exuded from the heart of the Son upon the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That should be the sound that flows out of our hearts. It goes against the natural tendency of our carnal flesh and teaches us how to celebrate our brothers, even when they resisted us spiritually, killed us through hatred of, of unforgiveness. So take up your cross of self-denial and self-abasement and self-negation, so die. That's the command today, die! So that others might live through your death. This is true rule and true government. God is, the, God is the, government is the ability, as we said, to bring divine regulation. I need to close. The bow typifies the Father in grace with which an apostolic people are infused. That spirit of love, that spirit of seeking to protect, 
bringing immunity, oneness, breaking all fracture and separation, that spirit that exhibits patience, kindness, goodness to all humans, irrespective of culture, creed, nationality, or religious preference. We don't love those who love us. That spirit enables us to exude a song from our heart for those who formerly led the way. Former fathers, brothers from whichever denomination, movement, or doctrinal preference that is not the same as yours. This song of the bow details the response of a generation moving from an old order in God, an order of servitude into the new order of kingliness, manifesting a regal way of life. The emphasis here is not on the celebration of the death of Saul, but as I close, five things, and I sit down. David expresses the dimension and the severity of the tragedy when he says in verse 19, he says how the mighty has fallen. David ensures that the name and the integrity of the old order is preserved. That it not in Gath, don't scandalize the man in his death and talk all the stuff that he did while he was alive. Don't tell it to the uninitiated. Number three, David stresses the loss of a mighty anointing or its failure to be preserved for future generations. David invokes a curse when he said, O mountains of Gilboa, let, let, let there be no dew nor rain upon you nor fields of offerings, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there. The shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. Fourth thing, there's a celebration of past victories in verses 23. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. So this man is celebrating the victories of fallen heroes that once withstood him. But as Saul was persecuting David, he, wait, he went up the Mount of Hebron. And as David ascended the mountain, he ascended in integrity. He ascended in purity. He ascended in a heart that begins to be, be, be known as the heart after God. And when he came to the heights of Mount Hebron, the tribes came and made him king. They said, David, we see in you the very heart of God. And that's the heart we want to migrate toward. And now David had to make this final decision. How am I going to look at Saul? my oppressor and persecutor, before I take kingship and the recognition of all the tribes at Mount Zion. And the last thing is a spirit of lament that honors past heroes. In verse 25 to 27, he says, how the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. And again, he says in verse 7, 27, how the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. If we cannot sing the praise of those that went ahead of us, even though these men didn't understand what we know, and we revile them and persecute them for because of that, then we are not different than them that has done it against us. So there needs to be a people of a different heart's position that can embrace everyone. I'm not saying that we must embrace somebody that is unwilling to repent. I'm saying embrace them even if they have repented from the misgivings of their lives. Like I did now when I was in Botswana. A man phoned me. I'm not going to mention his name. That messed up in Botswana. He called me and he said, Sean, I'm so sorry. This has happened. I couldn't come to the conference because of X, Y, and Z. But let it be known today to you, Sean, God dealt with me. I said to me, my brother, I am not accusing you of anything. I embrace you because you were willing to repent. So I embrace you and I come back in the fold. Even though you are a fallen warrior, we can lift you up because that's what the apostolic does. We lift up those fallen heroes. We sing their praise when they have clarified the inner constitution by repentance and forgiveness. And as I close... It is from this position that David now inquires of the Lord for the future direction of all the generations. David understands that there must be transitioning. The purposes of God continues to advance in the earth. And David 
ask the following in 2 Samuel 2 and verse 1 as I close. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up, David. Where shall I go up? And he said, Hebron. When the heart was clarified of any offense toward our persecutor, then we have been given the divine right by God to climb the mountain of covenant and association and intimate, interconnected oneness with an apostolic father, many sons coming together, totally clarified in the inner constitution of our hearts. Every mask ripped away. And who you see I am is what I am. There's nothing that I'm hiding behind who I am in my clothing and my dress code. You can rip everything off and that's what I am. I am what I am by the grace of God. So you no longer look after me, the flesh, but you only define me by the grace of God. Amen. God bless you. Well, I think you got a summary of the gospel of Jesus Christ <laughs> in this session. And of these three, faith, hope, and love, the most excellent is love. And I think if you've heard the spirit of so many POAs from this platform and other platforms, the present season is characterized by the spirit of love. Not faith, not hope, love. And in the love of God, faith and hope is made perfect. And I, my prayer is, as Sean has shared this word, it was so powerful, that if you want to be perfect, perfect love. If you want to be mature, be mature in love. And I'm learning more and more that God sends people in our, into our way only to use them as instruments to develop us in the love of God. That's all. Recently we experienced tremendous attacks against something that we were doing. And I had to meet with the management team and ask them why. Because... Because... There was no reason for it. And this team said to me, Mr. Naidu, you may not understand this, but people are jealous. I said, and they use the word jealous three times. I remember many years ago, we were investigated by the scorpions. We were put onto a, a list. Uh, and accused of money laundering in Peter Maritzburg. The scorpions came in and took our computers, and we were vilified in newspapers and so forth. At the end of two years, they came back and gave us our computers. And they, were, they were very intimidating when they came in, very friendly when they returned. <laughs> and I said to them, so what's the verdict? And they said, you're as clean as clean can be. So I said, why, did, why would this happen? And he said, jealousy, pastor, jealousy, pastor, jealousy. And he said, the people closest to you are the ones that will hurt you the most. Later, we came to learn that it was senior leaders. We later learned that we were on, on list with SARS investigating us because of accusations leveraged against us. But in the midst of it, God gave me the teaching on Hebron. That it's a place where you can sing the song of the bow in the midst of all the enemies that come against you. And you go down before your accusers and you never use the newspapers to defend you. And, uh, and God is a God of vindication. We just have to learn how to love him unconditionally. Uh, and let me tell you, the spirit of accusation is is the spirit 
of Satan. He's an accuser of the brothers. Yeah, so let's learn to love even the people that leave your church. You know what I'm talking about? Now some of you are acting so innocent here. Please stand. Please stand. Uh, let's learn to love even... And let me tell you, God will test your heart. Because at the end of the day, what did John say? God wants your heart. Uh, can you love your enemies? Okay, and they are not the devil. It's the people through which the devil exhibits himself, manifests himself. And our flesh is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. But it simply means our fight is against flesh and blood. But that's not the appearance. There's a spirit behind it. Amen. Lift your hands to the Lord. Come. Thank you, Sean. That was a very powerful word. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the way you speak to each one of us. You've captured our attention and you have gripped our hearts. Lord, if there be an ounce of pride in us, please remove it because what is the purpose of it? Because it's not part of the way you deal with us. If there be any anger, bitterness, envy, competition, uh, any inaccurate assessment of our own selves, oh Lord, help us to come to the place like Moses to be known as the most humble man in the earth. Empty us, Father. Remove anything that will rob us of loving unconditionally. And as we heard today, teach us how to sing the song of the bow. And we as the kings in the family of Judah want to learn the song. And we know that this is a song that we can only sing when we have learned how to celebrate our enemies as if they are heroes in our lives. And Lord, we can't do this pretentiously. We can only do it sincerely. Help us to do it. I bless everyone here. I bless everyone here. Let us, Lord, teach us, Lord, how to live a life that will bring glory and honor to your name. So, Lord, I thank you today. I thank you today for teaching us that love is the gospel. And to love one another is to glorify you. And we bless you, Father, that we are ministers of reconciliation, ambassadors of connecting people like a Shiloh would connect people to you. So I bless your people as they go from here. We will love our spouses. We will love those that have betrayed us in our marriages. Or whatever has happened, we will love unconditionally. We we'll love our children even if they've hurt us. And, we will, and our children will love their parents even if parents have hurt them. There will be peace in our homes, Father. There will be peace in our households. There will be peace in our ministries because we are a people of forgiveness. We don't ask for forgiveness. We first forgive before we ask you to forgive us. So teach us these eternal principles that we may live by them. I bless your people here as they go now. And I thank you that they will go in the grace of God that will keep them sustained. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be with you, go with you, and join us again for the next POA. God bless you.